Hello, welcome to Ask the Experts. My name is Hayden Summerhill, and this is a series of brief virtual talks by the faculty of Midwestern Seminary and Spurgeon College. We hope that these talks about topics such as theology, church history, ministry, and more aren't just helpful for you as you um, are equipped for your ministry, but we also hope that they um, give you a picture of what it's like here at Midwestern Seminary and Spurgeon College, and you can see how, how we are for the church. Today, we are joined by Dr. Matthew Barrett, Associate Professor of Christian Theology here at Midwestern. He is the founder and editor of Credo Magazine, and he is the author of many books, one of which has just released today. We are excited to announce with Dr. Barrett that Simply Trinity is now available. Um, Simply Trinity, The Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit, it's a great new book on the topic of the Trinity, which Dr. Barrett will be speaking on today. He's going to help us answer the question, um, why is it important to have a proper understanding of the Trinity? And so as Dr. Barrett speaks on this topic, I encourage you to um, reach out via the Zoom chat and ask questions because at the end, we'll have a live Q&A and try and answer and, and wrestle with those questions you might have about the Trinity. So before Dr. Barrett begins, I'll pray for our time together. Dear God, thank you for um, yeah, this opportunity for us to um, take a pause in our day and just consider who you are. The most important thing that we can spend our time doing, um, God, is, is focusing on you, worshiping you, um, understanding you more. And so we pray that during this time with Dr. Barrett that we would, um, yeah, just wrestle with um, this topic and, and, and begin to understand what the Bible says about who you are um, as the Trinity. And so, God, as Dr. Barrett speaks, um, just give us examples of, of how we can use this to equip the members of our churches to um, equip the people that we're discipling to, to know you and understand you more. And God, as we go throughout our week and um, go throughout our, our daily lives, let us, let us focus um, not just on earthly things, but keep our eyes above on you. God, we ask all this knowing that, that you are able. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I am so excited to talk to you today about the doctrine of the Trinity. And as you just heard in the prayer, um, this is a doctrine that is at the very center of what it means to be a Christian and what we believe about the Christian faith. In fact, it not only impacts you personally in your relationship with God, but it also should really influence the way the church as a whole considers who this God is that we worship week in and week out. Um, on that note, I actually have six points in particular that I want to draw your attention to. Six points that are going, we could call them six answers, in fact, that are going to help us uh, answer that big question. Why is it that the doctrine of the Trinity, why is it that a proper understanding of the Trinity is so essential, so indispensable, and so important uh, for our Christian faith? So here's the first one, and I've already hinted at it. Number one is this. Why is a proper understanding of the Trinity so essential? Because as Christians, we have no higher calling than to contemplate and actually know who our God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Sometimes uh, in the midst of uh, sometimes good intentions, sometimes bad intentions, we tend to become quite pragmatic about the Christian faith, don't we? Uh, we tend to think about even doctrines of the Christian faith only in terms of what that can do for me or how that's going to make a difference how that's going to matter in my day-to-day. -day. But before we get to that point, I think we need to back up a second and pause and ask the question, well, are we actually just treating God in a pragmatic way for what we can get out of him? Or do we actually come to the scriptures and come to God himself, wanting to know him and who he is even apart from us, apart from creation and salvation, if you go back in the history of the church, I think you will find some friends. Uh, some, so many of the church fathers, for example, they would wrestle with and reflect on the deep things of God, sometimes hard truths. But as they did so, they always came to those truths 
with an attitude and a mindset and a mentality to ultimately know who this God is in a saving and salvific way. So first and foremost, understanding the Trinity and understanding the Trinity in the right way is so essential if we are going to approach God, contemplate God, and know God as triune. Which brings me to a second reason, and it's actually very related to the first one, and that has to do with worship itself. If you are a believer, then that means that we should approach this God, who is Trinity, out of fear and reverence as we worship a Trinity, not one made in our own image, but the Trinity as revealed to us in the Scriptures. You see, some of the tendency, especially in our own day, is to come to the Trinity and to actually re-envision the Trinity really in our own mind, in our own image, in fact. Sometimes we do this accidentally, sometimes quite intentionally, and as a result, we actually redefine the Trinity, not uh, a Trinity that doesn't so much look like the God of the Bible, but a Trinity that, well, it looks a lot more like ourselves and the society around us. And if we're not careful, over, as years go by, we can start to enter into what I call Trinity drift. And very subtly, we start more and more to drift away from the biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity as we reconsider the Trinity and redefine the Trinity that's made far more in our own image or even in the image of our own society. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, God is quite serious about that type of error. In fact, he even goes so far to say that can lead to idolatry. Who knew, right? Thinking about uh, the deep things of God, a doctrine like the Trinity could actually be so consequential, so much could be at stake. Per perhaps we should then think about the Trinity in these terms. If we think about a Trinity that goes off path, that falls into a ditch to our right or to our left, we could be in danger of actually committing idolatry. By contrast, when we come to the Trinity of the Scriptures, we want to approach a trinity out of fear and reverence, one that we worship and worship correctly. In other words, it's only when we get the trinity right that worship is at its absolute best. Which leads me then to a third point or a third answer. Why is a proper understanding of the trinity so essential? Well, number three, because the gospel, believe it or not, the gospel itself depends in significant ways upon a right understanding of the Trinity. Now, that is a major fundamental pillar in our Christian faith. How then does the gospel itself tell us, communicate something to us about who this triune God is? Well, to answer that question, allow me to do a little bit of theology with you right here, uh, and take a step back and try to define some key aspects of Trinitarian thought. And if you hang with me for a second, I promise you, uh, we will come back to the gospel and you'll see how the two connect. When we talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, and as you can even tell from the, the title of my book, Simply Trinity, it's a bit of a nudge. It's trying to nudge you to a biblical and orthodox understanding of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Well, on the one hand, that means that when we are talking about God, we are talking not just about the belief that there is only one God as opposed to many gods, uh, but it also means that this God is one. That's right. He's a God who is unlike us. He's not made up of parts. He's not composed of parts. In theology, the way we talk about this is we say, well, God is simple. That doesn't mean he's easy to understand or quite basic or simplistic. Simple or simplicity, rather, 
gets at this idea that this is a God whose essence is his attributes and his attributes his essence. This is a God who is one. Now, that being the case, that actually has, well, that actually changes the way, it should change the way we then think of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are not different parts that somehow tally up to God. Uh, these are not parts that can be divided or that are divisible as if God himself could be divided or even corruptible. No, this is the Father, Son, and Spirit who are one God. Now, the way we put this in a, a bit of fancier theological language is we can say, well, these persons are what we call subsistences, subsistences of the same undivided, simple, and divine essence itself, which then raises another question. How then do we distinguish between Father, Son, and Spirit if this is the one simple and undivided God we are talking about? Well, Scripture actually is very specific about its answer, and it says there is one thing alone that distinguishes the persons. In fact, it's almost too basic to say because it's revealed to us in the very names that Scripture gives to us, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father, well, He is a Father, but unlike fathers in this world, I'm a father and I have children, but unlike me, He is a Father in a very different way. He Himself has no Father, and so He is unbegotten, or sometimes referred to as the principle, uh, without principle. What about the Son? Well, think about what that that biblical name means. To be a son is to be from your father. Except unlike human sons, this is a son who has no beginning. There never was a time when the father was without his son. And so this is a son who is begotten, for that's what it means to be a son after all, but he's begotten from his father's essence from all eternity. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, notice uh, this is not uh, another son or, I suppose, a, a twin brother or grandson. Uh, rather, Scripture speaks of the third person of the Trinity as spirit because this is, well, this is the spirit who is spirated from the Father and the Son from all eternity. Or sometimes we use another theological word. This is the spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son from all eternity. Now, that being the case, notice how with each of these persons of the Trinity, they are co-equal. In other words, they are not inferior to one another. There's no before or after. There's no uh, posteriori. There's no inferiority either. They are co-equal from one another. And you probably sense that, right, in the language that I used. Even when we're talking about the Son begotten from the Father, from all eternity, notice I said this is the Son who's begotten from the Father's essence. And therefore, as so many of the fathers in the creed said, this is the Son who is therefore co-equal with the Father. And likewise, the Spirit is co-equal as well. Now, with that, kind of the nuts and bolts there of some uh, you know, more advanced and robust uh, Trinitarian theology in place, what does all of this have to do with the gospel? Well, this remember that this God is Trinity, whether or not we even exist, whether or not creation or salvation ever happen, He is triune from eternity. That being the case, though, when we, our, our minds are open then to this blessed Trinity, we then come up against this beautiful knowledge by rubbing shoulders with the gospel itself. And as we do so, surprise, surprise, this is the gospel of the triune God. So ask yourself this question. Why is it the case, for example, that the Father sends the Son to be incarnate, to live and even die and rise from the grave for us and our salvation? Well, that is fitting, and that is perfectly appropriate because this is the same Son who is the only begotten Son, as John likes to say in his gospel, 
the only begotten Son, begotten from the Father from all eternity. And Jesus actually makes a big deal about this throughout the Gospels. The reason he is sent from the Father to accomplish this mission of salvation is because he is generated by the Father from all eternity. And likewise, when we come to the Holy Spirit, why is it that we receive this unbelievable blessing that the Spirit then is sent from the Father and the Son, given to God's people at Pentecost, and then indwells God's people so that we become children of God? Well, that too is entirely fitting and appropriate because this is the same Spirit, remember, who proceeds from the Father and the Son from all eternity. So, this third answer is quite crucial, isn't it? Why is it the case that a proper understanding of the Trinity is so essential? Well, it actually is the foundation, the ground on which we stand, that helps us understand the gospel and what that gospel then means for us as Christians. Now, I do have a fourth point, a fourth answer, and it's this. The Trinity, a proper understanding of the Trinity, is also so essential because as we then understand and perceive and know how this triune God works in salvation, we are then led right back to understand the very unity or simplicity, as we mentioned a minute ago, of this triune God in and of himself and apart from us. What do I mean? Well, think about the many works of the Trinity, creation, providence, and even salvation itself. Have you ever noticed how scripture, you think of a passage like Ephesians 1, for example, which talks about everything from our election to what Christ has accomplished, to the way the Spirit perfects that work in us. Have you ever noticed how Paul seems to assume that this is a united work? One of the ways that the church fathers like to say this, they said, well, these external works of the Trinity are indivisible. The Trinity is indivisible, that is, in his external works in creation, providence, and even salvation itself. Why is that the case? Why is it that Father, Son, and Spirit work indivisibly in salvation? The reason they act as one is because they are one in essence. In other words, it's only because Father, Son, and Spirit are one in essence that we can then have every confidence to say, well, in salvation, let's behold them acting as one. Now, to be clear, this isn't a mere cooperation with one another. That's tends to be how you and I work if we're on, say, a basketball team or a football team. We cooperate to make sure the, the common purpose or goal of maybe winning the game is reached. Uh, it's, it, it's also not the case that this is a mere uh, deployment or division or segregation of different aspects or works of God that are somehow divided up like a division of labor, as if, you know, in, in our society, you take one thing, I take another thing, and somehow all the work gets done. That may be how unity works in our society, but that's because we are individual persons separate from one another. We have to be careful, right, that we don't then assume that's the type of unity we're talking about with the Trinity. Actually, it's far more intrinsic than that. We don't just mean there's a cooperation. We don't mean that there's a division of labor. Actually, we, act, we, we mean in the strongest sense that Father, Son, and Spirit perform one single act, and that's because they are one in essence, which means that any time you consider the unity of God's external works in history, that well, it completely depends upon the unity of this Trinity to begin with. Now, there's a fifth one. We're getting close. Only two more. Uh, number five, why is a proper understanding of the Trinity so essential? Well, because a, a proper understanding of the Trinity, a, or what I would call a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity, it actually guards us and protects us from a really a host of Trinitarian heresies. And there are a number of them. You think, for example, of tritheism, in which in tritheism, you actually end up with three different or separate gods. Or, for example, you think of Sabellianism. 
sometimes called modalism, in which you, you don't actually have distinct persons, Father, Son, Spirit. You merely have a single person who may choose to manifest himself or reveal himself or act as a Father, then as a Son, then as a Holy Spirit. Uh, or you think, for example, of another uh, heretical tendency, which is subordinationism. This has been a very common one, especially in the early church period, in which many individuals actually denied the full equality, total equality of Father, Son, and Spirit, and inserted some type of hierarchy in God, in and of himself, so apart from creation and salvation, in God, in and of himself, and then the Son or the Holy Spirit were considered inferior, either in their uh, ontology, as we, we say in theology, or in their even, even in their function. And as a result, that compromised the full equality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But notice how a biblical and orthodox understanding the Trinity, well, it actually helps us avoid so many of those those mistakes. Which reminds me then that when we come up against our own present day, it can be tempting to think that we are immune from any type of Trinitarian error. And this really brings us to the, the last, the sixth point. Why is uh, a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity so essential? Well, it's so essential because it actually protects us and guards us from any number of recent and even novel understandings of the Trinity that have drifted quite a ways from a biblical and orthodox view of God. Let me see if I can just give you one or two examples of this. In the 20th century, there was this renaissance of Trinitarian thought. Everybody wanted to talk about the Trinity. And as they did so, uh, well, there was all of this excitement and even hype. But as things have settled down a little bit, many the theologians and historians have noticed, well, what kind of Trinity exactly uh, was being revived? And as it turns out, it wasn't necessarily uh, a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity as we have just described, uh, rather, it was what we call a social view of the Trinity. What was this all about? Well, in uh, past decades, the Trinity has been redefined very much in the image of our own society. Rather than speaking of the simplicity of the Trinity or these eternal relations of origin we talked about, the Father unbegotten, the Son begotten, the Spirit spirated, Instead, they redefine the Trinity more in terms of roles and relationships as a society or a community in which the persons uh, cooperate with one another. Some went so far to actually say that the persons of the Trinity are individual agents with their own individual centers of consciousness and will, which quickly brought on the charge of tritheism and they then felt the burden of having to answer, answer that type of charge and accusation. Notice, though, how actually a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity really keeps us from falling into that type of danger. For example, when we talk about the persons, these are not uh, individuals with their own wills, as if there's three wills in the Trinity. That would certainly pose a a real problem then for the unity of the Trinity. Remember what we said, now this is the Son who's begotten from the Father's essence. This is the Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son's essence. So if that's the case, then they actually are characterized by that divine simplicity, which ensures that they are indivisible in essence. Not only do they have then the one and same essence, but the one and same will. And if that's the case, well then actually social Trinitarianism has a number of problems that uh, 
really put it in contrast, make it incompatible then with a biblical and orthodox understanding of the triune God. Or take another uh, more recent example. Some evangelicals have argued that even apart from the incarnation, even apart from the economy of salvation, uh, they have argued that, well, the Son is functionally subordinate to the Father within the, the very imminent life of God. And they've gone so far at, at, at times to argue that um, this is something that's person-defining. It's, it's necessary for the Son to even be a Son. Sometimes they've even argued that, well, this subordination and submission actually is found within or flows from the Son's eternal generation. And from that point, they argue for a type of functional hierarchy within the inner life of the Trinity. But notice that too is inconsistent with and incompatible with a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity. You can see this in a variety of ways if we consider how that view uh, might lead to a number of dangers. Notice, first of all, how it redefines God more in terms of a, a type of functional society or community. Uh, much, very similar actually, to the social Trinitarianism we talked about a minute ago. Notice also that there's a danger here that it could lead in the direction of a tritheistic understanding of God. Because, well, if there is this hierarchy, well, that would require uh, diverse, different volitional capacities and faculties. And it'd be hard then to explain how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have one will. Notice also the danger of a type of subordinationism itself. If this type of submission or subordination or hierarchy in the Trinity, well, if this is person-defining, if it's something that flows out of eternal generation, well, that seems to actually pose quite a problem for the equality of the persons. Because remember what we said, if the Son is begotten, He's begotten from the Father's essence, right? That not only explains how He is distinct from the Father, but it also ensures that He is equal with the Father. But notice, the minute we insert a type of hierarchy, as if the Son is a lesser glory, perhaps, subordinate in that way, well, at that point, we have a very difficult time understanding how that type of inferiority is kept out of the divine essence itself. But this also brings us to a really crucial uh, point of application. If we go the route of uh, affirming some type of hierarchy uh, within the imminent life of God, even a functional hierarchy, notice then how it can actually undermine the thing we care about so much. We, we care about so much, right? Which is the gracious nature of the gospel itself. Remember uh, what Paul says in Philipp Philippians chapter 2, what Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, this isn't a son who is just subordinate anyway, as if becoming incarnate, for example, and submitting to the Father, as if that's something that's really no surprise because, well, this is something he must do anyways in the, in the imminent life of God. Actually, Paul and the author of Hebrews use very different type of language. They talk about a humility that is extraordinary, even scandalous. In other words, uh, Take Hebrews, for example. In Hebrews 5, verse 8, it says that although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And notice how Hebrews is putting the emphasis there on the fact that, well, this is a son who, who then learns obedience by virtue of his humanity and his incarnation itself. Or you think, for example, of Philippians chapter 2, in which Paul goes to great lengths to emphasize that this is the son who had to become humble, uh, one who took on the form of a servant. 
Paul seems to assume there, doesn't he, that this is not something the Son does anyways, but this is something the Son is going to do for the purpose of the mission of salvation. And so, all that said, we have to be really careful at this point that we don't confuse the Son in the form of God with the Son in the form of a servant. Because if we do, we actually run into a very common danger in our last century. What's that? It's just this. We tend to conflate who God is in and of himself apart from creation and salvation with the economy of salvation itself. And when we, con- when we conflate those two, we also run the risk of projecting just about anything or everything that occurs for the purpose of the mission of salvation back into the imminent life of the triune God himself. And that is a danger. Well, that's a danger that's been incredibly popular in the last century. But as we're starting to see, it actually has had an enormous collateral damage that actually leads us away from understanding, like John does in John chapter 1, who this son is in and of himself in the imminent life of God before we get to what he does for us in salvation history. I can't help but think of that that passage, John chapter 5, in which John tells us and tells, tells those who are hearing and listening and watching Jesus to honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Why? Because this is the Son who is one with the Father in glory. Now, if that's the case, notice how we've come full circle. At the beginning of our talk, we discussed how this doctrine of the Trinity is so important to get right because if we get it right, we not only avoid false forms of theology or even falling into a type of idolatry like we see with Israel in the Old Testament, but it also then helps us approach this triune God, understand him correctly so that we can worship him. And that is where we want to be. That is our ultimate goal. Which means then that when we talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, it is absolutely essential that we are faithful. We shouldn't take this lightly, but our aim Every time we try to articulate who this triune God is, well, our aim should be, let's go back to the scriptures and let's do so with the church and for the church, with the church, the ancient church even, on our shoulder so that we read the scriptures with their help. And as we do so, we discover who this God is. And on that basis, we then can turn and worship him in a way that is faithful and true. This has been so much fun getting to talk about one of my favorite doctrines of the Christian faith, the doctrine of the Trinity. We've only touched the ma- just the surface, really, uh, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, of this mystery of the Trinity. I would just encourage you, if you want to go deeper, I've written... 10 chapters in this book, Simply Trinity, and each one will not only ensure that you are faithful to the Trinity of the Bible and to the Trinity of the Christian creeds and confessions, but it will also drive you back to those fundamental beliefs to help you worship, to help you pray, to help you think about the gospel in a way that remains true to this one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. With that said, why don't I pray for us, and then I would love to hear what questions you have. Lord, we come to you as humble servants. We don't dare approach you as if we know better, but we submit ourselves to your word so that we can understand who you are, not only what you've done for us in salvation, but who you are apart from the world as the one God 
who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, help us not to forfeit or compromise in any way a proper understanding of you. And may that then fuel us up to then worship you in the way you intended. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrett. And I'm excited even now just getting to hear, um, hear your talk about diving into Simply Trinity myself. I've got my copy today. So um, as we go throughout this next time of Q&A, I encourage um, you all that have attended to just send your questions. I will try and answer as many of them. I won't, well, I won't try to answer. I'll try and get Dr. Barrett to answer as many I'll of them as possible. <laughs> yeah, I'll try and then he'll correct me. Um, so I, I'll start now, but uh, even as we go, con continue to use the Zoom Q&A to, to ask your questions. Um, the first one I have for you, Dr. Barrett, is you mentioned um, the, this concept of Trinity Drift, and you even gave us yeah. some examples of Trinity Drift. Um, at, moving forward, um, what are ways that we can keep ourselves as a church, as theologians, from experiencing Trinity Drift? You know, I, I can't help myself here. Um, I, I can't help but think of something that uh, Marilyn Robinson said. Uh, and if you've read Marilyn Robinson before, She's the uh, very famous uh, novelist. Um, but at one point in her writings, uh, if, I can, if I can just quote her, um, she says this. She says, I find that a lot of Protestant churches are embarrassed by things that are traditional, that as things become generationally older, they lose relevance. There's not just a great deal of loss, but misrepresentation of what we are. That is a sobering, sobering statement by Robinson. What is she after? And in light of our discussion, how might her words uh, speak into this very question, right? Of how, how can we avoid this tendency that is sometimes really subtle of just drifting slowly away? Well, as you can tell in her answer, I think we have to be careful not to just assume the cultural mindset that, well, whatever is new is just better. <laughs> right. um, that can kind of creep into our churches at times. And then we have a type of suspicion then not only to sacred things like the sacred text of Scripture, but even a suspicion towards, well, those ancient church fathers on whose shoulders we stand on in order that we don't then trip and fall into some type of heresy. All that to say, I think we need a different mindset today. Mm. Uh, rather than kind of approaching the Bible as if we're just enlightenment individuals with our own reason, as if no one's read the Bible before us, or I suppose no one's read the Bible since Bill, before Billy Graham, uh, we actually need a different mindset that says, wait a minute, uh, we need help. And in light of the many uh, ways we've tripped up the doctrine of the Trinity and muddled it up, we need to go back in time, uh, get into the DeLorean, as I talk about in my book, uh, to use that back to the future reference, get into the DeLorean, go back in time, and link arms with the church universal or the church Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but church Catholic is in church universal, link arms with the brothers and sisters that have come before us. And by doing that, I think you'll notice that when we start to drift a little bit or when some new and novel view starts to just be presented as if this is just biblical truth, our radar goes up and we, we, we notice it. And we even if we can't figure out exactly what's wrong with it, we have this gut feeling that, hold on a second, that seems to be inconsistent with what the Gospel of John says, or that doesn't seem to mesh with the Nicene Creed, mm. uh, a document that the fathers labored over in order to safeguard the church from, from heresy. Right. Right. Well, a follow-up question to that. Um, near the beginning of your talk, you gave a robust uh, theological explanation of the Trinity and the simplicity and unity of the triune God. Um, for, some, um, for someone that feels they need a better grasp, a better introduction to understanding the Trinity, um, in addition to your, your book here, is there a resource, maybe one of yours or some, one of someone else that could 
help someone with the basics if yeah. they're at the beginning of this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is a tough question for me to answer because if you know me, I've got, uh, you know, you come into my, my uh, study sometime, I've got so many books I want to recommend, yes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, but that being said, um, let me see if I can just put my finger on a few that might help, uh, help you out there understand the Trinity in the right way. Um, if you want a short book, uh, one uh, similar to this, but um, also to read as a companion, well, you'll notice uh, Scott Swain wrote the foreword to the book, this book. And Scott Swain also has just a small book that came out on the Doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, our books, in so many ways, tend to complement each other. Mm -hmm. I like to bring in some of the history and, and show how this Trinity drift has, has happened. And Scott does a fantastic job of taking you back to the Scriptures as well to help you understand just those Trinitarian basics to make sure you, you, you have uh, sure and solid footing. Uh, and I think that Scott Swain would probably say the same thing I'm about to say, uh, which is, don't just read contemporary books. If right. you want to kind of get out of some of the, the fog that has, has really confused us and, and made it hard to know what direction are we facing today, go back and read those who I like to say are on the dream team. Uh, those faithful uh, commentators and exegetes of Scripture. Read Athanasius's little book on the Incarnation and get the Get the one with C.S. Lewis's um, introduction to it. Or uh, go read, for example, uh, the Cappadocian Fathers, Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nazianzus, or Basil of Caesarea. They wrote books on uh, defending the co-equality of the Son with the Father. They wrote books on the Holy Spirit, in fact. Sometimes little books that actually are quite clear and so, so faithful. I would also, if I can throw one more in there, I would say go back to a short document that is the very uh, life stream, the very bloodstream of our Christian faith, and that is the Nicene Creed. Mm. It's only a couple paragraphs long. I would encourage you to just chew on it slowly and notice how careful, how careful our church fathers were to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity in a way that is faithful to the scriptures and to safeguard the church from a whole variety of heresies that would threaten the doctrine of the Trinity that we, we've been uh, discussing here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for you prospective students, even just hearing that, um, as if you're considering going to a seminary, I would encourage you to go to a place that goes back and studies those things. Um, if you're if you're in a theology class that's not considering the Nicene Creed, not considering the Church Fathers, um, then you might not be in the perfect spot to to study theology. So so come study with us. Come study with Dr. Barrett. Um, I have a question here um, about a, a point in your talk. You mentioned the word subsistence. Um, they say they've heard the word person used, kind of how you use the word subsistence, and they were wondering if you could kind of explain what that yeah. word means and what is how it's different than saying person. Yeah. Yeah, it is a, a bit more technical uh, word, and as theologians, we, we sometimes love those technical words, right. uh, not uh, because they're, they're hard or anything like that, but because they, they're like a knife. Uh, when you use a sharp knife rather than a dull knife, it gets right to it, right? It, it, it cuts in a way that gets right to the point. And this word subsistence is actually one that's quite old. Uh, we're not f as familiar with it today uh, because we, we don't tend to speak that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would say, let's, let's bring it back. Uh, let's make that word great again. And what does it mean exactly? Why, why is it being used? Well, if, if you'll forgive me for getting a little bit technical for a minute here That's and great. Uh, diving into the, the deep things just for a second. When the fathers uh, talked about the persons of the Trinity, they wanted to both preserve the unity of Father, Son, and Spirit, as well as their distinctness as Father, Son, and Spirit. In order to do that, they had to make sure that whenever they talked about any particular person, uh, they weren't speaking of that person in a way that would 
that would somehow make that person inferior mm. to another to to uh, one of the other persons of the Godhead. Well, in order to kind of safeguard the church from that that danger, uh, they would speak of uh, the Trinity as having one essence, right? That word is so crucial, one essence. And then they would say things like, well, this essence subsists or exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and they were quick to say, no, it's not as if the Father has more of the essence than the Son or the Son has more than the Spirit. They are, they are subsistences of the same undivided, simple, divine essence. Uh, a fancier way that they sometimes put this is they would say this essence um, has three modes of subsistence, and then they like to talk about paternity with the Father, filiation with the Son, and spiration with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, whether uh, we use you want to use that type of language, which I would encourage at points when you get into some of the finer points of theology, or whether you just start off talking about the persons uh, of the Godhead, notice we have we that the purpose and the goal and the aim here, right, is to really be careful and to make sure that at no point do we compromise um, the unity or the simplicity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. Awesome. Um, I have a question that's related specifically to um, the Holy Spirit um, mm -hmm. from a brother. He, he has asked and, and mentioned that we seem to as even the American church focused much on the Holy Spirit after the ascension and, and after Pentecost and yeah. the Holy Spirit, how he gifts us, how he gifts the church. And we don't think a lot about um, the Holy Spirit before that time and in eternity past. So how should we think more about the Holy Spirit as a member of the Trinity in eternity past? Excellent, excellent question. And I would agree. Um, there are times at which we so focus on what the Holy Spirit does for us or for the church that we neglect and hardly ever talk about, well, who is this Holy mm. Spirit anyways? Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, and, and that's a bit ironic, isn't it? Um, this gets back to what I warned about, right? Uh, we, we can tend to only think about the Trinity in terms of, well, why does the Trinity matter for me? Uh, rather than actually saying, well, let's hold off on that for a second. And let's think about who is this Trinity to begin with, even apart from you. If we get that right, we might, we might get the other part right as well. Now, you've asked about the Holy Spirit. Um, you've, I think you've almost answered the question, right? Because notice how in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is spoken of in different ways, sometimes as gift. In fact, a lot of times as gift. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, not just in the Gospels, but in the book of Acts as well as the book of Romans, you'll notice that the New Testament authors love to speak of the Spirit in this way, mm -hmm. which is natural enough because this is the Spirit that is given to us to indwell us and to give to us all the benefits that we receive in Christ Jesus. But that being the case, could it be that that is actually reflective, that it actually is meant to uh, lift our eyes heavenward and say something profound about the Spirit's eternal origin? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. In other words, the whole, the whole reason that it's so fitting for the Holy Spirit to be given to us in salvation is because this is the Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son from eternity. Sometimes we like to talk about how, well, uh, there never was a time uh, when the Son was not. We also need to remember there never was a time when the Spirit was not. That's an important point, right? Because that means that, well, if this is the Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son, then this is the Spirit who is equal with the Father and the Son in divinity. And if that's the case, then the glory we talk about when we discuss God, this, this glory belongs to the Spirit just as much as the Father and the Son. It is one glory. To use an example of this, uh, the Athanasian Creed, one of my favorites, a bit longer than the, the Nicene Creed. The Athanasian Creed says something really key. It says, 
There's not three almighties, but when it talks about Father, Son, and Spirit, it says there is one almighty mm -hmm. and one glory. And notice there how it's including the Holy Spirit as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're almost out of time for questions, so I have one um, selfish question to ask um, related to Midwestern and Spurgeon College. Um, when it comes to studying topics like the Trinity, studying theology, why is it important for men and women who want to serve the church? Why is it important and why is it helpful to come study these things at a place like Midwestern? Well, uh, you mentioned it a minute ago, I noticed, uh, when you said, hey, come, come to Midwestern because we're serious about the deep things of God and those uh, ancient fathers who talked about the deep things of God. Yes. In other words, uh, so often today, our first instinct is to uh, approach God or approach theology or approach the Christian faith. Uh, in a way that just depends entirely on what's happened recently. And if you come to Midwestern, well, and if you join, uh, say, a theology class I'm teaching, or perhaps even a class on the Trinity, you'll notice that I'm going to have you read books that you've never heard of, uh, books that weren't published in the last decade, not even in the last century, books that were written by say an Athanasius, for example, or a book that was written uh, by an Augustine, for example. Why do we do that? Well, at Midwestern, we have this saying that I'm sure you've heard a lot, we are for the church. And so as I like to say to my students, hey, if you believe that, if you're serious about that, then let's read the Bible with the church. And I think you will find as you come to Midwestern, Really, the ultimate goal is not just to draw you into the profound wisdom of a father like Augustine, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, theologian in church history, but Augustine wants to take you back to that deep, deep well filled with living water, which, of course, is the scriptures themselves and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Barrett. That, that is all the time we have. Um, Thank you, Dr. Barrett, for helping us think um, about the importance of the Trinity, um, help encourage our hearts even to want to study this more. Um, and thank you, attendees, for joining us. It's been a joy to have you. It's been a joy to answer all of your questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Midwestern Seminary and Spurgeon College, I would encourage you to reach out to um, my office, the admissions office here. You can reach us at M admissions at mbts.edu or find us on our school's website. Um, in addition, you may be interested in coming to another one of these Ask the Expert sessions. We do them about every couple of weeks, study different topics. You can um, find those at mbts.edu backslash ask the experts. You can also go back and watch our previous topics, whether it's Dr. King talking about um, the book of Amos or Dr. Allen talking about preaching. There's, there's several great options on there for you to um, go back and rewatch a session like the one that we had today. And finally, I want to mention one more um, thing about Dr. Barrett's book, Simply Trinity. Um, our office is actually doing an application promo this week specifically for you that are attending this session. If you apply with code ASK, that's A-S-K, um, you will receive Simply Trinity. We'll send it to you next week. So apply by this Sunday, use that code, and reach out to our office, like I said, if, we have, if you have any questions. Um, and for all of you, thank you so much again for attending. Um, have a blessed day, and we'll see you next time.